Good morning. So we are going to start our e sectional program for the fourth semester students on transmission and distribution. Welcome to the e sectional program of VTU. So this is a program envisioned to help the students to learn distinctly. Today I'll be talking about the introduction to the concepts of transmission and distribution. And we will discuss a little bit on the history and how it has evolved over a period of time. So this is Professor Umar Rao. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering at RB College of Engineering, Bangalore. So the course code is 18EE43 for all the electrical engineering students of BTU. So today's topics are the introduction to power system and structure of electric power system. And we will just study briefly on some aspects of generation, transmission and distribution. And we'll primarily be concentrating on the different voltage levels at different parts of the system. So I think in your first year basic electrical engineering, you would have studied something about um, fundamentals of electrical energy. So you all know that electrical voltage, you have both DC and you have AC. Uh, you have studied something about how to generate DC voltages and how to generate AC voltages. So the first electric power system um, ever which was developed was actually a DC system. That means it used to work on DC. So this first electric system was uh, installed by uh, none other than Edison. And uh, the DC power was generated completely using DC generators and was distributed using underground cables. So when I talk of cables, you all know, first you have overhead lines. So when we go out, we see a lot of conductors from pole to pole. And if you travel in a train, you see conductors from one tower to another tower, you will find some huge steel towers and so on. So they are all overhead above the ground. Underground cables, I'm sure, you know, in any city you would have seen people digging trenches and laying some cables, insulated. They're generally the cables are red, yellow, blue, black, thick cables. So they're all, you know, placed underground. So these cables are also conductors and they have an insulating cover over the conductors. That's the kind of um, colored thing you see like a black or red or yellow or blue, they're all cables. So the power system uh, incorporated by Edison uh, was established in 1882 and it was running entirely on DC and was distributed using underground cables. Underground means below the ground. But this system had very high I squared R loss, that is the heat loss, conductor loss. And it ran at very low voltage. It was designed at a low voltage. And the power was transmitted only for a short distance, for a short distance, around one and a half kilometers. And roughly around 59 customers were fed. It's an achievement it's by itself because it was the first time that power was transmitted. Though the distance is only one and a half kilometers, you know, hats off to Edison's uh, innovation and forethought, it was transmitted. The major drawbacks of this system was high loss and short transmission distance. Another problem is there was no way to step up to the voltage. Now, why did I want to step up the voltage? We all know that power is proportional to 
product of voltage and current right so if i step up the voltage then for the same power i will be drawing lesser current so lesser current means lesser i squared r loss and lesser loss means better efficiency clear yeah. so therefore they thought you know if only we could have higher voltages it would have been better but we didn't have a mechanism to step up dc voltages now the invention of transformer rectified this so i'm just telling you a history so that you will appreciate all what all we have today okay and we all know you have all studied that transformer works on the principle of electromagnetic induction which was discovered by faraday in 1831 so he performed an experiment uh, using induction between two coils and uh, there were three other people blethe mixaderi and zepernowski who first designed and used the transformer for both commercial and experimental systems later there were others who perfected the design however the credit for the first ac system ac network goes to nikola tesla in 1888 and he replaced the dc motors which were available at that time with ac motors and he paved the path completely for a natural choice of ac over dc this is the history of why we are using ac and not dc now ac voltage we can transfer from one level to another level because of the transformer so if anybody asks you what invention led to the choice of ac over dc it is the transformer it is the transformer so once the voltage levels are higher it automatically reduces the current and we can have large power transfers over longer distances at reduced losses clear so this was the birth of ac i would say the first ac transmission system was uh, commissioned in 1889 in uh, united states and there were two water wheel turbines on which we have our modern hydel plants all our hydel plants are based on that so 300 hp is very small today you are talking of you know hundreds of megawatts anyway for a beginning it was 300 hp water wheel turbines and uh, generated voltage was 4 kV but the power could be transmitted over 21 kilometers which was a big breakthrough compared to uh, what edison achieved uh, a distance of 1.2 kilometers so obviously this was a much bigger transmission system now it was impossible to transmit power in those days for 21 kilometers with ac with a, with dc because the losses were so high the losses were so high and uh, there were no conversion mechanisms available then please remember then electronics was not there and uh, therefore this ac system created a sort of revolution and tesla was a genius had many patents and came up with many ac not only the ac network came up with polyphase ac systems transformers transmission line generators you know i think we should really um, call him as the father of the ac uh, uh, transmission system eventually westinghouse purchased all these uh, patents all these patents and inventions and they started or uh, developing ac transmission systems for a short time um there were ac systems and dc systems they were running parallelly but the advantages of ac system far far uh, outlined the advantages of uh, dc systems and there was a huge debate globally whether we should go in for developing only ac systems or dc systems edison was for dc but westinghouse was for ac they advocated ac and by then the advantages of ac was clearly visible and 
uh, AC transmission systems took off. So what were the reasons? What were the reasons why AC became more powerful and more sought after than DC? The first was the possibility of increasing the transmission level voltages using the transformer. Secondly, DC machines, you know, they have commutators and so they need brushes. So their maintenance cost is very high. Maintenance cost is very high. Wear and tear is also high. And AC generators were much cheaper. So this was another reason why AC was preferred. And the third reason was AC motors, that is induction motors. Tesla gave us induction motors. So they were more rugged and very versatile. So these three reasons together stamped the choice of AC over DC. Of course, it's not just one, one invention which will revolutionize. We still had low voltages. There the problem was not with the transformer design, but with the materials available in those days. How do you have to insulate, right? You have to protect people. So for this insulation, the choice of materials available was not very good. And therefore the levels were still low. And uh, if you trace the history in 1922, so in a span of about 40 years, the voltage level re reached around 165 kV. And by 1990s, the voltage levels reached up to 1100 kV. And today there are installations at very high voltages. So starting with just 2.3 kV in 1893, today we have gone up to 1100 kV. Clear? So different countries use different standards, but within a country, Every country maintains a standard. Otherwise, you can't have equipment. And interoperability is not possible. Right? So, you know, there are standard, standards. So, different countries have different voltage levels for transmission. And uh, for interconnections, these levels are standardized. And it has been agreed in AC, when you interconnect two systems, you must synchronize. That means you must run with a common frequency. So the moment you talk of AC, frequency comes into picture and we must run at a common frequency, right? So if you keep the frequency too small, the size of your equipment will be large, the transformers, and motors and all that if the frequency is low. But if the frequency is very high, losses will be high. So with AC, you all know, you would have studied in machines, you have core losses, and that is the eddy current and ion losses, which depend on the frequency. So higher frequency means higher losses. So with a lot of, a little bit of trial and error, so now we are standardized all over the world, either on 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So USA, Canada, they use 60 hertz, and Europe and Asian countries, we all use 50 hertz. So this is briefly a representation of the system, power system. So we start with generation. We start with generation and you will have a course only on generation where you will study different ways of generating. Primarily we use steam, steam turbines as prime movers. So you have thermal plants. We have water turbines as prime movers, which give rise to hydrogen plants. Then if you use a nuclear fuel, you have nuclear plants. And today we have a lot of renewable energy sources. So normally in conventional generators, the generating voltage levels are between 11 kV to 33 kV. 11 kV to 33 kV. And this generated voltage is stepped up to around 220 kV to 400 kV or even more, even more. We saw you can go up to 1100 kV. You can go up to 1100 kV. This is only illustrator, right? And then you have a lower voltage, the sub-transmission level. So you can have around 33 kV to 66 kV. At these voltage levels, you can give to large consumers 
okay and you can further step it down to distribution level where in india we step it down to around 415 volts that is all your roadside transformers the transformers you see on your road right and so the three phase voltage line to line voltage is 415 and this you can get a line to neutral voltage phase voltage of 230 volts and all our single phase equipment we use locally like uh, you know at the at the consumer domestic level like fa fans mixy washing machines etc all these in india operate around 230 volts okay so you have consumers taking voltages at different levels they take we say as evacuate the power so they take the power from the system industries large industries may take the power at 132 kv smaller smaller industries may take the power at 66 kv or 33 kv clear so you have different voltages at which a consumer can draw power finally residential and domestic consumers if it is single phase in india we draw the power from the utility at 230 kv or if it is three phase commercial establishments at 450 to 440 volts so we have generation okay then we step up the voltage transmit transmit means what transport the power and then tap the power at different voltage levels to distribute okay so the transmission capacity of a line is proportional to the square of its voltage you know power is proportional to v square so if you if you step up the voltage you can transmit more power and uh, in india we have 765 kv and later on in some slides i will show you we are going to establish we, have, we are already establishing uh, a very high voltage vc also and for by this time what happened as the voltage levels went on increasing simultaneously there was a revolution in the electronics industry okay there was a revolution in the electronics industry and conversion from ac to dc and vice versa from dc to ac became possible at high voltages dc has its own advantages right our you remember our main main drawback with dc was the inability to step up the voltage so because i could not step up the voltage my loss were high because the current was high right so now if i could get high dc high dc then dc has the advantage the reactance of the line doesn't come into picture in dc you know the reactance is zero for dc because frequency is zero so the voltage drop will be minimum the voltage drop will be minimum so you can transmit power over larger distances so people started you know finding a way to take the advantages of both ac and dc clear so what they found was over 600 uh, long distance long distance transmission for voltages above 600 kv ac transmission was not very economical clear so by 1960s and 70s when the power electronic technology matured and facilitated high power electronics dc transmission became popular so what do i do in a dc transmission i have the ac at the sending end i converted it to dc rectify then transmit dc so i take all the advantages of dc transmission i capture then at the receiving end the dc is converted back to ac inverted and then i use it for ac loads today that is also slowly changing we are trying to replace with dc loads okay so this cost effective dc transmission is today extensively used for bulk power transmission there are many dc transmission lines across europe asia um, usa china and other countries even in india so in india these are some of the common levels so we have 765 kv these are all rms values so please remember in a three phase system the voltage you specify is the rms line to line voltage okay and at different voltage levels you have a band what is the maximum voltage permitted and what is the minimum voltage permitted 
So it is 800 times 728. So we have different levels, 400, 220, 132, 110, 66, 33. And then at, at the lower levels, 415 and 230 volts, single phase. Clear? So this I have given for India. So different countries have different, uh, you know, voltage levels, which they prescribe. Now, we saw generation transmission. So transmission occurs at higher voltage, right? So you step up, transmit at large distances over higher voltages. Slightly, you can step down to around 132 kV, which we call as the sub-transmission level. And then from 132 kV, we step down, maybe to 66 kV or 33 kV, from which industries can take power. And then in India, we have 66 kV, 33 kV, 22, 11, 415 to 230 volts. And we also have some 6.6 kV, 3.3 kV, 2.2 kV. So industries will be drawing power at different voltage levels. So your substations will be designed based on the voltage levels, right? And these voltage levels, how did I get so many voltage levels in the system? I generate at 11 kV and then I, I am saying I go up to 765 kV and then I'm having so many voltage levels, 132 kV, 33, 66, some 3.3, 2.2, so many levels. So all these are facilitated by different transformers. So transformers of suitable rating. So this is how your system looks like. So I have power plants which generate bulk power, 1000 megawatts, 2000 megawatts, okay? And then I step up, transmit. So you can, I'm sure now you would have seen such towers everywhere, right? And then bring it down to neighborhood transformers and then poles, your local poles, and then finally to your house. In between, I'll have industries tapping at different voltage levels. They'll be tapping the power, tapping the power. So you see, you put on a switch and enjoy your fan, but the power comes from thousands of kilometers away, thousands of kilometers away. That's the beauty of a power system. A huge, massive network operating. It's just a wonder. I would say it, it has to be, you know, like, like the seven wonders of the world today. I would say power system networks and internet networks are wonders of the world, of the modern world. Now, let us just briefly see something about India because we are in India. It is good to know about our Indian power sector. So, our central control is with the union government. Okay. It is vested with the Central Electricity Authority. And you have the Ministry of Power. There is a ministry which controls everything. The, the entire power sector in the country is the, comes under Ministry of Power. And we have the Central Electricity Authority. And we have several uh, national generating companies like NTPC, National Thermal Power Corporation, NHPC, National Hydro Power Corporation, NPC, National Power Corporation, the Power Grid, which is the national transmission company, which controls and regulates interstate, inter-region power transfers. Then you have some regulators, they are the appellate tribunal for electricity. They form the regulations. Then you have CERC, Central Electric Electricity Regulation Commission. We need to have laws. We need to have regulations to operate. You have customers, you have generators, you have vendors, you have products, right? So everything has to be regulated. We need standards, okay? And you have PTC, the power trading company. These are only some major companies. Don't think that this is an entire list I can't give you. There are many, but I want you to know some familiar ones because you're all students of electrical uh, engineering. Then in the state government, we have we used to have state electricity boards, EBs, they were called, SEBs, state electricity boards. Today, we have what are called as unbundled utilities. See, these electricity boards, they controlled everything in the state. Generation, transmission, distribution, everything was controlled by the electricity boards. 
Then slowly, in, in late 1990s, they started what we call as unbundling. That means because networks became huge, large. So we, we, we are no longer, no longer talking of megawatts of power. We were talking of gigawatts of power, right? So very difficult to handle one unit, one single unit to handle everything. So then we went into what are called as unbundled utilities. We, we had a bundle. The bundle was power system. It included generation, transmission, distribution. We unbundled it. We made it into generation as one unit, one bundle, transmission as another bundle, distribution as another bundle. Okay. So they are called as generating companies, transmission companies, and distribution companies. Some example in Andhra Pradesh, we have Transco, AP Transco, Andhra Pradesh Transco, Genco, AP Genco. Okay, generation company, discoms, distribution companies, so on and so forth. Different states, they had three, four, five, depending on their need and the size of the state. So in state governments, first you have unbundled utilities. They are also regulated, but accountability is now split. So each bundle is accountable for its performance. Instead of one central bundle being accountable for the whole thing. Then we have State Electricity Regulatory Commissions, SERC. So they regulate the flow of electrical power within the state. Then the, so earlier days in India, what happened? The power generation was entirely in the hands of the government. Slowly, privatization started coming in. And we had private power producers and they are called as independent power producers, IPPs. So they build, own, and operate. Okay. So every state had its own IPPs. Andhra Pradesh was un under uh, Chandra Babu Naidu was one of the first states to allow private generation. So the advantage with private generation is it need not be huge. They can't invest. They don't invest so much, but they support. They support the government production. So you have, so these are some of the major entities in the power industry in different states. So there, it is called as functional unbundling. So we'll quickly see what are the responsibilities. So the Genco's, that is the generation companies, they are responsible for power generation and setting up of new generating stations. Clear? Then you have the Transco's, the transmission companies. So they manage the entire transmission system within the state. Okay. And purchase and supply of bulk power. I, I buy from one state and sub, give it to another state. Right. And wheeling. Wheeling means allowing your transmission lines to be used by others if they want. So a private producer is there. How do they transmit the power? So they wheel it. They wheel it to the through the existing transmission lines. So that is monitored by the transcodes, the transmission companies and the grid operation. Okay. The distribution companies manage the distribution to the end consumer. And how do I extend new consumers? So how do I plan the distribution? So Bangalore is growing. So how do I plan for the growth to meet the demand? Suddenly industrialization is there. Different kinds of consumers come into existence. IT industries as a bloom. So they need a different kind of supply. So how do I manage all that? How do I extend? So all this is the role of the distribution company. Finally, it's all after all for the consumer. The consumer may be an individual, maybe a government entity itself, like a street lighting, etc. Or it could be uh, you know, bulk um, sales and it could be commercial establishments like malls, etc. So all that, they all fall under consumers. Now let's just briefly see about Karnataka. So in 1957, the KEB, the Karnataka Electricity Board was established. And I told you these KEBs, they monitor everything, generation, transmission, distribution, everything within the state. Okay, so like that you have TNEB, Tamil Nadu and Electricity Board, then we had APACB, Andhra Pradesh State Electricity Board, and so on. Then in 1999, the KPTCL, 
the Karnataka Power Transmission Company was established. So they took care of the transmission of the power in the entire state of Karnataka and also construction of substations and transmission lines, their maintenance, etc. So many new lines and substations were added to the existing states by the KPTC Act. And then we have KERC, that is the Karnataka Electricity Regulatory Commission. So they regulate the power industry. And then now we know we have distribution companies. So in Bengaluru, we have BESCOM. In the Mangaluru region, we have MESCOM. Then we have HESCOM in the Hubli region, JESCOM in Gulbarga, Chamundeshwari Electricity Supply Company. So these are all distribution companies. So they take care of distributing the power within the state to the consumers. The consumers, as I told you, may be industries or it may be individual customers or government utilities or commercial establishments. Okay. So thank you all. So this lecture, I just wanted to give you a brief history of the evolution of the power, power industry and how different uh, regulatory bodies evolved and how different companies evolved and how we moved slowly from one regulated body to unbundled companies in India. So I will continue in the next session. Thank you.